Hello and welcome to this webinar on professional outdoor photography. My name is Charlie Borland and I've been a photographer for almost 40 years getting started in the late 1970s and I've really spent quite a bit of time in the business not only doing commercial type photography but substantial outdoor landscape and recreation photography and turning around and marketing that to publications commercial clients, and really pretty much anybody that would buy photography, as well as uh, being represented by about a dozen different stock photo agencies during my career, and also founding and co-founding two photo agencies myself. So what I'm going to do today is kind of share that experience with you about how I've successfully photographed and marketed photography and uh, earned a pretty decent living off of doing just that. So in the early days, when I got out of photography school, I was really focusing on the landscape, doing quite a bit of travel around the country and photographing pretty much any place that I wanted to go photograph. Beautiful locations, national parks, and so on. Eventually, one of my clients uh, offered me a two-year contract to drive around the United States photographing beautiful America for the most part. And so I did that. And uh, it was a really fabulous experience traveling around to every state, going to their natural wonders, their city skylines, and those types of locations, and pretty much photographing anything that might appeal to tourists who would buy books and calendars. And for the most part, I used a 4x5 view camera for about 50% of the photography that I did. But that contract ended, and I had this massive file of images to start marketing and, and selling and that sort of thing. And so I enlisted with, uh, or I should say I signed up with one photo agency that was in Seattle at the time. And they were pretty big. And they uh, encouraged me to move beyond landscape photography. They really liked my landscapes, but they said, if you really want to get into money, start photographing the people. And since I was already out there doing a lot of photography, or I should say camping and taking rafting trips and that sort of thing, I decided to branch out, not only do just the landscape photography, but also start focusing on people outdoors. And I believe that branching into the people besides doing just landscapes is what really made my outdoor photography a successful part of my business. It resulted in getting a lot of uh, magazines commercial use customers, and quite a variety, as well as some clients who would hire me to uh, photograph outdoor-related subjects. So it was really the best of both worlds for me. And I did that for many, many years, and I still do it to some degree. But, you know, as the industry changes, we all need to really adapt to those changes. And I'll talk more about that coming up. But in the later years of my career, and this is probably more recent, is I really started expanding on something, again, that I'm going to talk about shortly, which is concept photography, and got into really kind of doing a lot of different things in that regards. This also coincided with the time, about the time that Photoshop came out and became available for us, and really, more than that, it was the time when I learned enough about Photoshop to figure out what I could do. And so that's what really got me into creating much more conceptual photography. And uh, bottom line is there's more money in doing that. So I uh, branched out and started doing a lot more of that. So I'm going to start by looking at an overview of the business as I see it. And starting right here with the nature photographer and what is their basic job or what is their business all about when they're becoming a photographer who's specializing in nature photography. What are they going to do? What are they going to shoot? And who are they going to sell it to? These are all really important considerations to being successful as a nature photographer. So the nature photographer in general shoots stock photography for the most part. Then they market it to calendars magazines, note cards, tourism-related businesses, advertising, web use, and books. If a nature photographer gets into the assignment business, they might also be shooting magazine assignments. They could possibly be shooting nature-related subjects for an ad agency, a tourism company, or work company direct. On the other hand, one of the reasons I use the term outdoor photographer rather than nature and landscape photographer 
is, again, based on my experience of and also something I'm going to talk about a little later, where I think the industry is going. And that includes the people photography, or I'll call it here, adventure photography. And what does their business require them to do? Well, it's pretty much the same thing. They're going to go shoot stock images, and they're going to try to get those in calendars, magazines, tourism, advertising, and web use. At the same time, they might very well be out there looking for assignments using their adventure photography experience. And for the most part, the clients are pretty much the same. The magazines that buy uh, outdoor adventure photography, ad agencies that might have an account related to outdoor and adventure, tourism-related companies, and or I should say really tourism related agencies you know most counties or towns have a tourism agency that promotes that location uh, for the tourism and so that's pretty much what tourism related businesses are and then again company direct now who might be a company that needs adventure photography well uh, anybody that makes outdoor sporting goods mountain bikes kayaks you know that type of thing then I want to talk about what I think the future is. And this is my opinion, but this is where I think photographers are going to do the best if they're outdoor people. They want to shoot landscapes. They don't mind shooting adventure sports, you know, that type of thing. But in addition to that, they're willing to branch out even to what I call commercial-related outdoor photography. So again, they're going to shoot stock photography. And that can be adventure as well as landscape and nature, and it's going to be marketed to the same types of clients. They might also be able to secure some assignments. Again, that might be magazines and agencies, tourism, company direct, but also product manufacturers. And this is kind of back to what I just mentioned about you know getting the opportunity, or I should say getting the assignment, to photograph the catalog for a company that makes a wide variety of kayaks, for example. So what's that mean to the average photographer. Well, it means they need to be really good at landscape photography as well as adventure photography, but they're going to need to probably expand into other areas like product photography, people photography, and location photography. In today's environment for photography, it's quite obvious that there is an absolute glut of stock photographs. So I'll talk about this a little bit more, but it's really important that I start right here by saying you're going to really want to branch out and look like you're different than everybody else who goes to Yosemite or Grand Canyon or something like that. And so that's going to be really important, I think, to being quite successful. It's very true. It's a buyer's market. With that glut of images clients can find just about anything they need. I can't say everything they need. I have to say just about everything they need. And so it's it's uh, important to be heading towards photographing for things that your research indicates need to be photographed. And again, I'll talk touch on that again here shortly. Usage fees for the most part have stalled, plummeted, or even disappeared, meaning Prices for photography are not going up, they're going down. And this, again, is really important to how you set up your business to succeed. And one more thing is, unlike other professions, like, let's say, a lawyer or an accountant or something comparable, where they got to pass the bar exam or be certified, there's no barrier for anybody to get into photography. And, and that's a good thing, but, it's, but some people that have been in the business a long time think it's a bad thing. So I'm not going to judge or, or make the make a call on what is better or worse. It's just that these are another indications of the challenges you as a outdoor and nature photographer are going to experience, which is very stiff competition. So I think it's really important to understand that photography as a profession is a business, period. It's a business. And we create products and we sell those products to customers who have a need for it. Bottom line, very simple like any other business. As an outdoor photographer, we're mostly expected to, and especially when it comes to stock photography, we're expected to do all the research and development, try to decide what we should be shooting, where and how. 
We then build that product. We pay all the upfront cost to creating those products. And then we do it even though there's no client or guaranteed sale waiting for us. These are forces that work against you to some degree. And so it's so important that the more you know, the more successful you'll be. If you join a stock photo agency, as an example, you're going to be continually asked to innovate, come up with new ideas and do it in a new way. You need to stay ahead of the trends, pay attention to what's going on in the world and in the business. You're going to be asked to shoot everything in a multitude of ways. And for the most part, an agency, once you submit all your images, let's say you send 100 pictures, they might keep two. So it's one more reason to really target what you're doing and do that effectively. One good thing about agencies is they often share their research and development about what clients are asking for, what the trends are coming up, and so on. And this helps you focus on what you should be shooting. As a freelance photographer, your business means that you are the creator and you do that research and development that I just talked about. You're the producer. You go make it happen. If you're photographing people, you become a casting agency. you got to find the right person or models for whatever you're going to photograph. You're then the director. This means you get your actors, which are those models, to act the way you want so you get the photography you want. Later, back in the office, you're the editor. you got to find the selects. you got to figure out which ones are going to stand the best chance of selling. Then you're the sales manager. You're out there beating on doors, trying to f- present your photography to people, let them know you're out there, and hopefully make those sales. You'll be in charge of accounting, making sure you're staying up on your uh, income and your taxes and your filings and all that kind of stuff. You got to deliver. Of course, in the early days of my career, we always uh, shipped everything by FedEx or mail or had a delivery service pick up and deliver it. Fortunately, now everything's done online and that's going to make your job a lot easier and more efficient. Then again, I throw a lawyer in here, even though I'm a lawyer and I have no experience in being a lawyer, but once in a while I get stiffed by somebody and I have to sort of throw a few legalese words out there and make sure that I end up getting paid or that I am acting in a lawful manner, meaning understanding enough about the law and photography to kind of keep myself out of trouble. The success in the business, I am convinced, means you pay as much attention to the business of photography as the art of photography. So you're going to need to juggle your desire to be an artist with the need to also be a business person. And I can tell you that many times in my career, more when I had a studio in the city and was competing directly with a lot of other photographers in the city, that, you know, there's always a photographer somewhere that we all look at and think, oh, you know, the work's not that great. Okay, that's the way the business is. I'm not criticizing anybody, but that's how the business is. We look at other people and think, that's not that great a work. But at the same time, I have been beat out when I was bidding on projects to try to earn some business, I got beat out by the person who was maybe not a great photographer, but really good at selling. And so this gets back to my point right here. You need to pay as much attention to the business as you do the art. So to get successful and stay successful, it's really important to come up with a strategy about how you're going to run your business and what type of products your business is going to create and sell. This means understanding the markets that you're going after. If you live in a city, as an example, and you want to be the top outdoor photographer in that city with all your beautiful landscapes from your state, you're going to need to figure out who buys what in your particular market. Then you go out and you create the products that the market is going to demand. And you will sell your photography by target marketing to those markets that your research came up with. So you might ask yourself, wanting to get into the business, just what should I shoot? Well, there's a lot of ways to approach it. I kind of liken it to, do you want to be a a local hero or an international nobody? Meaning you want to travel around the world shooting tourist destinations and you go to specific places and you shoot 
and you're there for maybe a couple days, then you move on to another place, you move on to another place. You're not going to have that extension of uh, that extensive of a collection of photography from each location. Or you can stay in your home state and in that city and you can just work the state and do everything you can to get those who buy photography, meaning ad agencies and design firms and the magazines, that you are the top guy for everything in your state as far as photography is concerned. So hopefully that gets you thinking about what you should shoot. But here's some ideas for the landscape and nature photographer, the national parks. The national parks are very popular in the United States. And there's even big advertising dollars spent promoting tourism in those national parks. Then there's wilderness areas. A smaller market probably, but still very worthy of paying attention to. Travel destinations. Where do the tourists go in every state in the United States? Community locations. Okay, that gets back to me talking about you living in a city and you want to be the photographer who has everything. City skylines, city parks, festivals, parades, all that kind of stuff. Agriculture is often overlooked, and I have come across a few photographers in my career who do nothing but specialize in agriculture. They not only have all the landscape pictures of you know, farms and crops and all that kind of stuff, but they also have farm machinery at work, and they go off and they're working for some of the biggest corporations in America who are in the agribusiness, so don't overlook that. Environmental areas, let's say a wetland area that's protected and is full of wildlife, birds and ducks and all kinds of stuff, there's a place to spend some time, especially if it's an urban environmental area around a city where people go kayaking to bird watch or, you know, hike the trails, that sort of thing. Natural human disasters, this is a good subject often overlooked. Natural disasters hurricane tornado damage, um, terrible forest fire damage, you know, that type of thing. Human disasters. I have a photographer that I know. He's sadly no longer with us, but uh, he was on the Exxon Valdez oil spill up there in Alaska way decades ago, and he was up there immediately photographing, and his pictures were all over the place in Life magazine and Time and all kinds of stuff. So think about that type of stuff. Wildlife and insects, another subject. I don't think the markets are as big as the other things we're talking about, but definitely uh, something to think about. And then nature in general, beautiful landscapes, as well as other types of things. I think macro flowers. Uh, I've had a lot of students in my courses who like to shoot macro flowers. And even I do once in a while. I just don't, but I'm, but I'm pointing that out as one example where the markets just aren't that great for that type of thing compared to a beautiful landscape from, you know, let's say Utah's canyon country. So um, these are pretty much the type of general subjects that a landscape photographer is going to capture. Then there's the adventure photographer. What are they going to photograph? Well, recreation and lifestyle, camping. Biking, boating, hiking, backpacking, fishing, and all sorts of types of things like that. Then there's the people who are uh, active in extreme sports like rock climbers and hang gliders and kayakers and so on. These guys are what I call the participa participatory photographer, meaning they go climb up El Capitan in Yosemite and they start taking pictures. Those pictures are going to do way better than the person way down on the ground pointing the camera up photographing the climbers. And in the recreational and lifestyle section at the top here, these can all be photographed without being a participant in the activity, meaning you can photograph someone fishing and you're standing on the bank while they're standing in the river with their uh, hip waders on fishing, where rock climbing and these other extreme sports are really easier done by the photographer who participates in that sport. So now what makes a marketable photograph? Well, first of all, the, the, the obvious, sharp, well exposed and high enough resolution. But more in depth is storytelling images, subjects that are timeless and have a long lasting appeal. And what's that mean? Well, um, 
let's say a picture of a forest fire that that has a kind of generic look to it or um easier explained is not a nature photograph but but let's say marilyn monroe every once in a while every few years her name becomes big somebody goes and buys one of the photographs of her as long as they're not public domain and that gets published and so those pictures are making money for decade after decade so it's it's a good mindset to sit and think that some of these pictures that i want to capture i hope will be timeless and that's the good thing about landscape photography. Rarely is there anything in the photograph that dates it. You know, you photograph lightning over the Grand Canyon. Nobody's going to know that you shot that in 1989 and it's still being licensed and published. So that's the good part about landscape photography. And the last one here is conceptual. That is probably the most important consideration in marketable photos than anything else clients actually buy photographs based on concepts so they meet their communication need and I'm going to go a little further in depth with that here very shortly so here's just two examples a landscape photo I shot on the left with a 4x5 that I really like not an uncommon picture other people photograph it as well and then I had an idea a long time ago for the picture on the right that has vastly outsold the landscape photo, strictly based on concept. But now let's look at some adventure photos from the same location. The one on the left, I think, is a decent shot. It might have been published once, if I remember correctly. But the image on the right is the same location. But this is my top-selling adventure photo of all time. And it's got a person in it, and it has a concept someone enjoying the outdoors so that is huge but let me move on to one even even more powerful this is by my buddy ralph clevenger he created this image at least 20 25 years ago and do you want to know how much money this image has made him you know <laughs> you're gonna be shocked but well over a million dollars because it is so strong on concept now, there's already plenty of people out there who have ripped off the idea and recreated their own, and they're not doing near as well. But, uh, you know, just to give you an idea, that if you have the right idea and the right concept, you can make a fortune, even in today's tough markets. So, all right, so let's say you're, you're a traveling photographer. You really want to do just the national parks, but if you pay attention to the cities that you go through and what makes them unique then you shouldn't pass that stuff up. This is Dodge City, Kansas. I remember this from all the westerns I used to watch when I was a kid. So when I went to Dodge City, I was excited and I wanted to see what was there. Well, this particular composition ends up being the one that says Dodge City the best out of anything else I could find there. It's been published a couple times. So think about what, what symbols in a particular location are going to say what you want to say. Or I'm sorry, are going to say something about the city. Now, here's a regional park. This is part of the National Park Service, but it's a very small National Park Service location. This, for the most part, is going to be very popular regionally, I think, in the state of Indiana. They're going to be the ones that are going to buy this photo and publish it. Doesn't mean that you from your home in, say, California aren't going to be able to sell it to a calendar, but the big markets are probably going to be more local and close to it. And so I call these the, you know, pretty much the regional locations that if you're in the area, you want to master these places. You want to have a great collection of Lincoln Boywood home in Indiana if you live there. Then, of course, the big national parks, the parks that are symbols of what America is all about. The Grand Canyon is an example. This stuff still sells and still published in books and calendars and so on. It just needs to be really unique to, to stand out there and do really well because of the stiff competition. Then, of course, it doesn't mean you can't go into the wilds and or even if you're not in the wilds but find amazing locations that aren't really anywhere that people are going to go oh i've been there nobody knows where this is as far as i know i might be the only one who's captured it maybe not hard to say 
but it's powerful images like this can do well and you just don't know where they're going to do really well until you get out there and start marketing my first thought is the calendars and then of course agriculture this stuff will sell and I have some examples coming up but the reason that I'm showing this well first of all is to talk about adventure but also when I go out and photograph these fields and I happen to meet the farmer who drives by wanting to know what I'm doing and I explain oh I'm just a travel photographer then I ask them geez can I come back another time and photograph you now this is difficult if I'm driving cross-country but if I'm local as in the case of these two I can uh, go back at a time that's convenient for them and photograph them and I have made good money off of both of these images so just to show you you start right here and take some pictures and they want to know why you're photographing their field early in the morning if they happen to drive by and I tell them why Oh, okay cool well hey can I photograph you another time why not ask I always give them prints when it comes to adventure photography I sort of categorize it two ways I call it take an adventure or make an adventure take an adventure I've done this so many times I sign up for a rafting trip somewhere I want to go specifically so I can photograph it I then you know tell the outfitter that I'd like to photograph and they oh yeah no problem just get people's permission who the other people who are going to be on the trip so then before the trip launches I explain who I am and what I'm doing and I get model releases from everybody then there's make an adventure this is where I will take people out mountain biking or I'll take people out to set up camp scenes and that type of thing and in these cases you're going to need to find models where on a rafting trip as an example there will already be people there that you can photograph as long as they give you permission so very important one of the things that I profess when it comes to photographing adventure is what I call isolate and illustrate these are the same guy at the same location photographed two different ways and I do this on purpose first of all if you look at the image on the right Mount Hood Oregon is in the background so that's very easy to identify that this is a fisherman in Oregon but then by zooming in and creating the shot that's on the left I've isolated him from the background so when you look at this picture you don't know where it was taken is it Wyoming Colorado Idaho Washington who knows where it was taken because nothing in there identifies where it is this helps broaden your markets you can sell your photograph to more places if you can't identify it so I always isolate and illustrate on everything so one of the techniques in adventure photography that is uh, very helpful to selling the photograph is lighting up the tent I just put a flash in there do a couple test shots to make sure exposure is right and then I have a lit up tent and I have sold a lot of these this way also campfire shots are really popular but the difference here is I've added a flash to light their faces because the fire won't really light their their faces very well or when there's good exposure or I should say good light on their faces from the fire itself the flames become white hot I prefer the orange flames and then putting a flash in there to basically brighten up their face so let's look at a couple other ideas for adventure photography the headlamp shot on the left are two people out skiing at night when there was a moon it was overcast but there was a moon out so it was pretty bright and they're wearing headlamps and then on one of my Grand Canyon trips I uh, asked her to put on a headlamp and read a book and you can see the rafts in the camp in the background and it's it's a concept that works really really well a concept so think about that type of stuff don't just shoot the tent think about how you can make the tent look more livable and interesting and you know that type of thing mountain biking again there's all kinds of magazines out there for my mountain biking if you live in an area where mountain biking is popular the tourism agency is going to also be buying photographs of mountain biking rock climbing and bouldering I am not a climber but I was able to shoot these types of things that weren't super high in elevation yet strong on concept this is uh, California's um, 
Buttermilk area, great place to go shoot climbing because nothing is super high. Very easy to get good vantage points. In fact, this was shot at the same place where the sun was getting ready to set, but I dressed them up like hikers instead of climbers and just had them go up on top of a rock. I'm on top of another rock and zooming in. So lots of potential. Hiking and backpacking as well as llama trekking. These are the types of subjects that are going to have a market. Another thing I do is what I call people outdoors. People enjoying the outdoors, but not necessarily in an activity. Not everybody climbs mountain bikes, camps, or anything, but they like to go outdoors and hike. So that's what these two basically represent. The guy on the left's a friend, and he decided to squirrel up these trees and start reading a book. And I thought, oh, there's a picture. And on the right are the same two people that were in some previous photographs. And they're at sunrise sitting on rocks watching the sunrise. So think about less activity, but strong on the concept of enjoying the outdoors. Same thing with winter. Plenty of stuff to do in winter that's worthy of photographing. In fact, the image on the left has been a very good selling image for me. And do you guys have any idea why? Well, the answer is two women dog sledding. You just don't see that that much. But that's exactly the case. And beyond being used extensively in local tourism in my area, this was also used by other people who use the image because of the two women. And then on the right, I was shooting snowshoeing in an aspen forest using about a 60th of a second, which allowed the feet to blur pretty good, but keep them sharp. So get into the action. Don't just stand back. Get up close, wide angle, run by. Have them run by you kind of thing. Mature adults. This has been a concept for good selling photography forever. People who are senior citizens, but young senior citizens who are active and enjoy the outdoors. Maybe they retired early. That is a concept that you want to keep in mind. Fishing. The image on the right did very, very well. Now it's too outdated because it's all old gear, but uh, it did very, very well. And uh, I'm standing on the bank and he's standing in the river posing for me and continuing to cast. This is so easy to pull off. But also when you look at this, look at the light. The sun wasn't hitting the background. It made him really stand out. The other guy I stumbled on while hiking in the Sierra Nevada and he was there fishing and I immediately set up my camera and started clicking away as fast as I could. Then I went up and asked him if I could take his picture and said, yeah, no problem. And he gave me a release. So that's perfect. Creative excellence is so important to successful images. Just like when you might have taken your first photography class, if you did on composition, lighting and exposure and so on. Good selling images have great compositions, great lighting. Of course, they're tack sharp, but they tell a good story. When it comes to composition, keep in mind a few other things, what I call shoot for layout. You might set up your perfect composition for your landscape photo that you're going to send off to the calendar company, which is what this image could be. It just turned out that this was perfect for a wraparound cover with the Northwest Oregon being on the front cover and the left side of the picture being on the back cover. And so that's, you know, that's kind of important to allow space for text, but do not make the mistake of allowing room for text in every single picture you take, because that's a, a recipe for failure. I could, because I tried it here. It just naturally happens to have plenty of room for a headline right across these sequoia trees. I mentioned great lighting. These pictures were both taken on the same day. The one on the right, right at sunrise, I still was shooting, trying to shoot at about 11, and you can see the difference. The image on the right has been published many times. Image on the left, I don't think ever. So it's a good example of what not to do. The lighting just doesn't work anymore. The haze is building up, building up on the horizon. It just doesn't work. So when it comes to planning your business, there's a couple things to think about. Do you want to be a specialist or a generalist? There's a difference. And I'll admit right here before I explain these, 
everybody's probably pretty much both. But what is it you like to shoot? Well, a specialist targets specific subjects. Now, I consider an underwater photographer to be a specialist. But most landscape photographers go shoot everything, including macro flowers, uh, the night sky, good light at sunrise on the rock formations out there, and so on. So they, they end up, the generalist ends up with more variety of subjects, while the specialist just has, you know, their underwater photography, for example, or a bird photographer, or something like that. When you look closer at each of these two approaches to, to being a photographer, the specialist has a strong coverage in their specific specialty. Again, birds, sharks, underwater would probably be more general if the photographer specializes in sharks. The interesting thing about specialists, and let's take the shark photographer as an example. Let's say they've been photographing sharks for a couple of years. They have a massive collection of images, and they're marketing to all the magazines, the ad agencies, and so on. When they specialize in one subject, sometimes they can gain rapid name recognition quickly as the go-to person for sharks. But they also have fewer markets. While the generalist really has kind of less coverage of more subjects. For example, lots of generalist photographers like to do the national parks. And they'll go stay someplace. Let's say they're coming from the East Coast to the West Coast for a two-week national park tour where they're going to photograph sunrise to sunset every day. They're going to go home with less coverage of each of those parks than the specialist who lives in Utah and has does nothing but the national parks. The generalist, however, tends to have more markets such as calendars, magazines, books, and so on. And uh, so it's something to think about when you're setting yourself up for a business or if you're already in business, how do you want to stand out? So what's your shooting strategy? Do you wander and look for photos? Well, I do this a tremendous amount of the time uh, because that's fun. That's part of being out there and exploring. Is it the most efficient way to getting marketable photography? No, but I have to do it. Are the locations that you're going to go photograph places you just want to visit and photograph? Or do you research the markets to find out what's going to sell? So what am I talking about? Okay, as I'm conducting this webinar, there's a proposal to make an area in Utah called Bears Ears into a national monument. Lots of people in favor, lots of people against it. Okay, I would say right now, if I had some good Bears Ears area images, I could be sending those off to all the outdoor magazines, the Wilderness Magazine, the Sierra Club Magazine, all this kind of stuff, and probably have a good chance of selling something because it's in the news. So that's why I talk about researching. Some things to think about with your shooting strategy is to diversify your products and services, meaning the more things you can offer to clients, the more success you're going to have. Photograph subjects and locations that are in demand, like I just mentioned, the bear's ears. Shoot conceptually if you can, and also use people if you can. Not all of these are going to be an option for everything you shoot, but if you're always thinking about it, you might decide, oh, if I had a person standing out on that rock, that would make this shot killer. And I have done that many times. Shoot the landscape, then I run out to the point with my camera pack on, have my remote trigger to fire my camera. Now I have a human kind of silhouetted against the cool background. That's definitely a worthy strategy. When it comes to researching locations, again, consider areas of environmental concern, natural disasters, man-made disasters, and anything that's making the news. So look at these two photographs. I sold both of these well, numerous, if not many times. Can't even remember anymore. These are both the summer after the Great Yellowstone Fire in the late 1980s. I went back there to show how nature was recovering. All these trees are dead, but the flowers are going crazy. So think about that type of stuff as well. I've talked about shooting conceptually, so I want to expand on that a little bit more. So what are concepts? Well, the word family is concept. 
competition, risk, teamwork, trust, success, and many, many more are all concepts. So let's look at this here just a little bit. What says competition? Well, a lot of times it could be two runners on a track in the Olympics or even a high school track. But what also says competition is two elk with their horns locked battling each other during rut. What says family? Okay, mom, dad, two kids sitting on a park bench smiling at the camera. But also a deer doe with two fawns following her in a meadow. That's family. So you can put your mind to work here and come up with all kinds of things. Risk is a great one. A rock climber hanging off a rock says risk. These things sell. So just keep in mind concepts. Here's a little bit of a concept here. I, I call this environmental destruction. Others could say environmental harvest or something like that. You got the two logging pictures, but you have water pollution from a mine in the lower right corner. So there is an image that could very well appeal to an environmentally slanted magazine that's doing stories about the environment. I think I might be the first person who ever shot a tent with Christmas lights on it back in the 1980s because I had never seen a single one published. The idea hit me. I snowshoed out, set this up, shot it. It sold very, very, very well. Christmas in the Wilderness. There you go. That's a concept. But let's go further. With the image on the left, I used to live here, up in the mountains, and I put a tree here, decorated it, and wait for a blizzard. This is sold numerous times as well. And on the right, I decorated this tree and put orange or I'm sorry, red Christmas bulbs on it, then photographed it with a four by five. Then I went in, scanned it and went into Photoshop and really lightened it up and got rid of all my footprints and that type of stuff. And it also has done okay. Here's an image on the left that I had the idea to create decades ago. And a woman's reading a book by candlelight with the mountains in the background. In my local area, this sold very well and many times. So again, it's a concept. But in addition, this has sold to Christian publishers as and under the concept that, you know, here's someone outside reading the Bible. So again, there's an idea of a concept that has many, many uses for different types of clients. So one time I was camping with my kids, and we were not backpacking, but I very but I planned on taking all my props. These two packs they're wearing are props that I buy for photo shoots only. And I stuff pillows in them or blankets or something like that to make them look like they're full. And I put these on my models. And so I put my kids in the meadow and I said, reach down like you're picking up something and then look at it and explore it. They're not, they got gravel in their hands. There's nothing there that's, uh, that's anything. But it's the concept that made it work. And this was then spotted by a publisher in my area who uh, put this image on the cover of a free brochure. Think about concepts. Here's another one. I shot the sequoias on the left, and then uh, I was on a trip with uh, somebody that worked for me, and I had her stand on the left with a day pack on and look up at the trees. And boom, about a year later, I got a cover. So... If you're going to take an adventure, let's say go raft the Grand Canyon. I've been fortunate enough to get to do that three times, and it's an amazing adventure. Uh, on one trip, I took my 4x5. I shot a lot of 4x5s of the scenics, just everything beautiful. But I also photographed the people, and this is huge. There's so much opportunity to create marketable images if you shoot the people. So do it all. Now, you might be wondering where to find models. I never go to a modeling agency and pay $150 an hour for a model. Never, ever, ever, ever. Unless I have a client hiring me and they're going to pay that bill. I go to the kayaking store. I go to the windsurfing store. I go to the mountain biking store and I put a little flyer on the bulletin board or I might say something to somebody and say, hey, I'm looking for models um, to do some things. So can you, is, you know, can I put this on the bulletin board? And I hope that somebody's going to call. 
I used to trade prints for models, but that doesn't fly very well anymore. A lot of people say, nah, I don't need any prints. They're looking for money, especially if they work in that store that you went into. They don't make a ton of money. So if I'm going to go out and shoot somebody for a couple hours, I might try to slip them 40, 50 bucks, a little bit longer, a little bit more, you know, that type of thing, up to maybe a hundred bucks a day. Uh, everybody likes to make extra money. Plus, I usually try to make my photo shoots kind of fun. So that's one way to find models. One of the most important things is to never forget to get a release. A model release for any person, even if you just took a picture of their foot, and a property release as well. I'll tell you the story of this farm here. I'm ripping across the Midwest on my way to a waterfall that I've never been to. And I drove by this and I went, wow, look at that reflection. I got to the waterfall. The waterfall was only about six inches wide. There was nothing there to photograph. I thought, oh, heck with it. So I raced back and got back to this farm right before sunset. And you can see what happened. The clouds broke up and created just incredible lighting. And so I sat there and I photographed it. The farmhouse is just to the left out of the picture. And the farmer comes out wanting to know what I'm doing. And of course, I'm always congenial and say, oh man, that if this is your farm, it's so beautiful. I wanted to grab a picture, you know. And he's looking at it and he'd lived there 40 years. And he said, wow, I never saw that before. And I'm thinking, whoa. <laughs> so anyway, we struck up a conversation and I said, man, I am happy to send you a print. I'll make you a print when I get home. And I did that. So I got his address, got home, made him a print, and I sent him a property release and said, you know, is there any way that you'd give me a release so that I could try to get this published in calendars and magazines and all that kind of stuff? Now, I really didn't need a release to get it published in those, but I needed a release to get it published commercially. And so he sent me back the release and said, yeah, no problem. But every time you publish it, I want 25 bucks. Well, I went ahead and did that for years, sent him money every time it sold. I had no problem with that. But the last time I sent him a check, it was returned as undeliverable, and I don't even know where to find the guy. But anyway, keep your eyes open for that type of stuff. Now we'll talk quickly about clients and marketing, because that really is what it's, what it's all about. If nobody's buying your photography, you're not going to be in business for long. So first of all, You've got adventure markets in the editorial. You can also sell landscape images to editorial markets. And so you want to look for the magazines that are in your area of specialty. In addition, calendars. The Hike America Oregon is a book. The right to write of that is a church bulletin. And below that is a note card published by a note card company. These are all very worthy of your photography. Corporate use. I've done a lot of photography direct with big clients, big corporations. Uh, you know, a company like IBM. Now, I'm, they're not a client of mine, but those big companies have corporate in-house communication departments. Figure out who they are and send them something you believe will appeal to them. And if you get on their website or you can find their annual report and look at it and, and see, oh, they don't use my type of photography, don't waste the people's time. But at the same time, if there's anything close to you, to what you do, then by all means, send a nice promotional package and try to get them to keep your business card. Advertising. No matter where you are, absolutely market to all graphic design firms and advertising agencies with your photography. They buy stock. Product manufacturers going direct to clients like the Earth Stove over there. I worked with their graphic designer on all those images that they put on the cover of their catalog. And same thing uh, down below. I had marketed my outdoor imagery to a catalog company of outdoor sporting goods and so on. So definitely look at them as somebody you can work with directly. Now here's something I always have been saying for years. It's not who has the photograph. It's who's got the client. This is so important. If you do not get out there and market Nobody's going to know you got a lot of great shots, so it's so important to do that. How do you find those clients? Well, you can find them 
in uh, your local market by you know finding out where ad agencies and design, design firms are listed. I used to use the phone book. That was a very easy way and probably still a really good way. But also any lor- local organizations that, uh, like the ad club and all their members is, is one way to go. But for publishers, I go to the bookstores. I look at who's doing scenic photography books because maybe down the road I can pitch them on doing a book of my state or my area. Go through all the magazine racks. Now with my iPhone, I just take a picture of the inside of the magazine with the contact info rather than writing it down. There's the book, The Photographer's Market. Definitely a good place to go look for places to market your photography. And then, of course, just doing internet searches is another way, like calendar companies. Just Google that, and you'll start finding names. Then you find their website, and you can find the contact information there. Now, what about stock photo agencies? Well, I think at this time I'm doing the webinar, it's a very difficult time for the photo agencies. But at the same time, some of them are still having record profits. They have different business models, so some are doing better than others. Should you join an agency? I say absolutely join an agency. But also look at their contract and the terms. If you join an agency and they said you cannot sell any of the images we keep, then that's that's kind of a setback. Uh, because if you want to sell to a calendar company or a brochure company, just right down the street from your office, do they even know that your photography is at that agency? There is where some problems can can be created, meaning it's costing you potential income if the agency is strict on that. So explore all the agency's contracts to make sure it's going to work for you. Then again, take a look at Photo Shelter. That's a great place to house your images. It's all one-stop shopping. Clients can go in there and buy, pay, and download. You don't have to do anything except be out there at the Grand Canyon photographing sunrise while you're earning income. So it's something you might want to consider. Now, if you want to build your own site, there's a company called K-Tools that makes great software for building your own stock photo website. The difference here is, and with Photo Shelter, is you got to do the marketing for the most part. Now, people do go to Photo Shelter and buy because they're so big. But if you set up your own photography website, you know, John Doe or Jane Doe stockphotography.com, you got to do all the marketing. And so that kind of interfere with your desire to uh, to basically be out in the field all the time. Okay, the last thing I really want to talk about, and it's where I've been really kind of heading during this whole webinar, is the commercial outdoor photographer. I truly believe that photographers these days got to be extremely diversified if you want to make a great full-time living doing outdoor photography. You can still shoot the landscapes, you can still shoot the adventure sports, but you need to start looking at other avenues of photography to keep that business going. And the reason for this is I have had many assignments derived from my outdoor marketing that were not that outdoor related. So when I talk about this, what I'm referring to is this type of subject. First of all, the image on the left, he's the star of the Axemen TV series on History Channel. And I was asked to photograph him. And sure, no problem. How fun. And so went and did that, and it paid a couple grand. Okay. The middle image was an assignment from an ad agency who had been getting my outdoor-related promotional pieces and hired me to do a campaign for Black Diamond, who makes lots of outdoor gear. And in this case, we were in a studio. Then on the right, uh, a clothing catalog. And uh, we shot people doing adventurous activities, running, biking. Here we got a guy skateboarding. But at the same time, I also shot all the clothing shots you look at here in the studio. Not very difficult to do. So really, I'm a believer in the commercial outdoor nature photographer is going to have much better time succeeding by being diversified and throw in video. Okay, so the commercial outdoor photographers got plenty of options. You know, the magazine work, which is kind of lower pay. 
design firms, ad agencies, and product manufacturers are going to pay substantially higher than magazines. The bottom line, though, is you need to be able to pull off whatever you're asked to do. So market what you do best. Most clients really think that you, as a photographer, if you shoot stock and you're selling them something, might also be available to shoot an assignment. This has happened to me so many times. They get my promos or they're buying a stock photo and then they said, hey, I need a portrait of the president of this company uh, that I'm buying your stock photo for. Can you do that? And of course, the answer needs to be yes. It's important to understand if they like doing business with you the first time, they might turn around and give you an assignment. But you have to be prepared to shoot a lot of different things. So if you're going to take on an assignment, be prepared to have the following skills so you can pull it off. Meaning really the ability to photograph people, product, and architecture. What I mean by that is I was selling stock photography to a company that then wanted to hire me to photograph people wearing their clothing. They also needed product photographs of the same clothing separate from the people wearing the clothing outdoors. And one of the shoots was at a lodge. They wanted some nice interior photography of the lodge. So you need to be capable of doing all of that. You need lighting. You need to understand how to use strobe lights and lighting gear and that type of thing. And in some cases, a good sense of styling. Some clients will pay for a stylist when you're shooting clothing to be there and style the clothing on the models, but other times they may not be. So get a sense of that. by You just look at other catalogs and magazines and see how people styled them, and that'll give you a good sense of what's going on. And then finally, Photoshop. Oh, Photoshop has made everything so interesting and different. So be a pro at that as well. When you're out there looking for assignments or you've been given an assignment, it could range from anything. And again, I was marketing to a very popular magazine on the West Coast. I did many, many assignments for them until the photo editor left and went somewhere else and I never got back in. So prepare for that as well. No matter how hard you work getting a client, it could all end tomorrow. But anyway, back to these pictures. Uh, sent to the Oregon coast one time to shoot uh, the city of Newport. Restaurants, hotels, scenics, people on the beach. The center top image of the cowboy, that was done for a guest ranch out in eastern Oregon. And they wanted a portrait of him in front of this door he had carved the, the entry door to the lodge. Down below that, I was asked to photograph a different mountain lodge. And this is the restaurant. And unfortunately, they were not open. So there was no people there. They were remodeling. So the magazine was a little upset about that. But I asked them previously if I could delay it till they open and they said no so and then on the far right uh, I was asked to photograph a brew pub so there's some variety in the nature as well as travel assignment business now I was asked to shoot this ad for um, local tourism so again my outdoor abilities landed this for me and on another one that was a really good job uh, again, these, this ad agency was getting my promotional materials in the mail, my direct marketing, hired me to shoot this catalog of trail running, street running, hanging out at the parks, rock scrambling, and mountain biking. It was a blast, and it paid in uh, well into the five figures. Now, another thing you can do to get started in adventure photography, again, is take that that adventure where you pay to go on an adventure and you're going to photograph action and the you know people sitting around the campfire, all this kind of stuff. But then consider approaching outfitters uh, as a trade and uh, see if, if you can get on a trip in exchange for photography. Now, they're not going to do it if you don't appear to be a qualified photographer, so make sure you got a killer portfolio and make the trade you're proposing very appealing to them. And these days, that includes probably shooting video footage as well as GoPro type stuff. Uh, the result of that is you'll get all these images. They get to use images for free, but you get the images to market. And, you know, I landed the cover of Alaska Airlines ma magazine from exactly one of those trips. 
So it's important to learn how to do location portraits. Here I'm outdoors with one strobe. This was for tourism, local tourism, but also the technical shot of the uh, more technical shot of the cowboy in front of the door and two lights that I was using. Now what about marketing? Okay, you're going to find yourself marketing your stock photography and your assignments or your desire for assignments. And a lot of times there's some overlap. While I've been marketing stock photography, as I've already mentioned numerous times, I landed some assignments and vice versa. I get an assignment. Later on, they get in touch. Hey, do you got any stock photos? Sure, I do. So sometimes you can market to the same place for both stock and assignment, but other times, like a calendar company, they're not going to do assignments, so you're going to only want to market stock to them. So when it comes to finding clients, and this is more on a national or regional level, you can buy a mail list of advertising agencies and design firms from AdBase, Agency Access, and even ArtMarketing.com. So that's a great way if you want to do a direct mail campaign to get started. So how would you want to market? Well, I mentioned specialists and generalists before. If you're going to market to a calendar company, as example, then you're going to market your generalist stuff, the things that are going to appeal to them. Landscapes, flowers, wildlife, you know, could also be sailing, you know, those types of things because many calendar companies have a really diverse subject line of their calendars, meaning they'll do a calendar on sailing, they'll do a calendar on, on uh, with um, uh, Christian quotes and that type of thing. So look at all of that. But when you market... You really want to market as a specialist to each client. And again, what I mean by that is, if you're marketing to the calendar company, you could be a specialist that just does, just does landscapes, but you could also sell them your flowers, your sailing, and so on. But if you're the shark photographer, that's going to be a much more limited uh, client list. So you're going to want, the, want to find the people who might be looking for shark photos. And that might be wildlife magazines and that sort of thing. So there you are a photographer that specializes in sharks. You need to let them know that. Even when you're going to the calendar companies, you're a specialist that specializes in landscapes or flowers or sailing, you know, that type of thing. At least it's going to get you remembered a little bit easier. So you're wondering who they might call. Well, one of my favorite uh, explanations for that is if you live in Moab, Utah, next to Canyonlands and, and uh, Arches National Parks, you're going to have extensive coverage of those places versus the East Coast photographer that I mentioned earlier who only spent a couple days in each park before heading up to Colorado or something like that. The clients are going to know that the photographer in Moab has tons of great photography of those national parks while the guy who took the short trip isn't going to have that much coverage. So this is really important. A magazine, once they know that the specialist lives in Moab, they're going to always call that person for photography for that area. Now that doesn't mean that the other person from the East Coast doesn't have a chance. That's not true. But it's a strategy and that's all you need to think about is it's a strategy. So what about making contact with clients? Well, email is a great way to do it, but make sure it's a permission-based email list that you buy because people get really upset. Direct mail, the repercussions are a little bit less, but still, if you can buy a mail list that has addresses, then uh, you stand less chance of having emails that uh, that are not permission-based in those lists. When it comes to direct mail, it's so cheap to print anymore that you might as well have professionally printed promotional postcards or whatever you're going to do. When I'm doing something very, very small, like I'm writing a letter to a photo editor to introduce myself, I just do inkjet promos. And these are some examples right here. These are really old. Uh, I haven't done any new ones of these because I've gone to direct printing since then but I used to send these with a cover letter and they worked quite well and showing my best work and I would do one that had adventure photography on it as well as tear sheets from all my magazine covers and stuff and this convinces a photo editor that you're the real deal that you've got a lot of images so that's important and and the 
the inkjet prints are okay for short print runs. But again, you might want to consider regular printing because it's so cheap now. When I started my first photo agency called Borland Stock Photo, we uh, worked with a local designer. We did a trade. They needed a bunch of stock photography, so we traded uh, them designing a bunch of postcards for us, and we ran this campaign for a while. Later on, my business had changed, and I'd moved around a bunch. I hired a designer to professionally design postcards for me that I could then mail. Now, this is two different postcards, uh, one side of two different postcards. Here's the other side of those postcards. And I don't know if you can see it, but the text that is in the upper right corner, that is the image numbers for those photographs at my stock agency. So if they liked a picture that was in my promo cards, they could just make note of the number, go right to the web address, which is also on the card, and buy my photograph. So that was a strategy. Okay, finally, consider becoming a writer. I've made good money writing photo text packages for some magazines, and Better Digital Magazine was a magazine that was in Australia, and I met the editor when I was in Dubai teaching, and he invited me to write an article for him about myself and stock photography. Very cool. Paid 1500 bucks, and I gladly did that. So, And I've done a lot of writing and got paid for it since then, but uh, it's something for you to definitely consider doing. So finally, strategy for success is to research the markets, shoot diligently for those markets, and carefully evaluate where to place those images. Create beyond the capture. And what I mean by that is take advantage of Photoshop to make amazing photographs. Use all the available marketing resources. Websites, web portals, stock agencies, you know, maybe even some social media marketing as well as direct marketing, which would be the postcards or some type of brochure that you might print and send out. The biggest thing to remember is out of sight means out of mind. No business if nobody knows you're out there doing stuff. Important, when you make contact with an editor or a buyer of any kind, work hard to establish a relationship. I made the most money in my career with people that I established a relationship with, meaning I sent them a bottle of wine at Christmas or something like that. Even in the city, take them out to lunch if they were feeding me a bunch of work or buying a bunch of my photography. Relationships are crucial. Think about how many times you might ask somebody, hey, do you know anybody that could tune up my car? Well, that's networking. Same thing goes with photography. And then finally, market like crazy. So that's pretty much it for my webinar on professional outdoor photography. You can find me online at borlandphoto.com. And finally, since you watched my webinar on YouTube, if you're interested in my course on how to be a professional outdoor and nature photography, there's over 100 videos and about 15 hours of uh, content there. And you can find this course at Great photographycourses.net greatphotographycourses.net and since you're watching this on YouTube if you use my coupon code YT50 you get the course for half price so anyway go shoot some great photography and make a lot of money wishing you all the best <music>